Right, well, let, let's get started. So uh, firstly, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Byrne, CEO of TM Group, and uh, really pleased to welcome you to what actually is our last session of TMTV for the 2022 series. Uh, this year, the format's been slightly different in that we've asked our panellists to present their top five uh, on a topic uh, at each one of the sessions. Um, and so today's topic, we're going to cover uh, the keys to unlocking the property transaction. Um, it's a packed lineup, so actually we don't anticipate having much time for questions, but if you have got a burning desire to ask a question, please use the Q&A uh, facility that you'll find at the bottom of your screens, and we'll try and get to as many of them as we can. And if we can't, we'll get back to you after the session with some answers. I hope you find our topic of interest today, and please pay close, uh, pay close attention, uh, as at the end of it, we'll be doing a quick uh, listener poll uh, to find what the actual audience think is their top one uh, from what gets presented to you. Um, so now let me introduce your panel briefly. So my co-host today and the person that's uh, got the uh, envious job of summarising uh, the panel's top five into his own is Tim Bannister, who's Director of Property Science and Innovation at Rightmove. Um, we have Stuart Young, who's MD of ETIV. Uh, Jeremy Raj, the National Head of Residential Property at Irwin Mitchell. Tim Smith, founder and CEO of Inside Legal, and also uh, representing the LSSA as chair of the Legal Software Suppliers Association today. And finally, David Bridge, who's head of conveyance in at Kite Solicitors. So, quickly then, back to our topic and keys to unlocking the property transaction. Um, sort of spotted a nice little play on words there. So, of course, yeah, everybody's interested in getting their hands on their keys uh, when, they, that, when they're moving into a new home. Um, and really, that's all you're interested in on your big day of your move, I suppose. Um, interestingly, I was with some friends last night whose daughter's just bought their, her first property. So first time buyer, flat, vacant possession, simple. You know, one of the easiest ones you would, you would think. But unfortunately, she was one of those people that were sitting in her van with all of her possessions at 5 p.m. And unfortunately, the conveyancer told her to call the what is a very large uh, building society about releasing the funds. And, and the building society said, yeah, you're in a queue, you know, you're on the list. And as the clock ticked down past and very approaching close to the estate agency closing time. So, you know, that's a real world, real world situation. And it's not anecdotal. You know, we hear that that type of a scenario all the time. So, so it's, it's not a perfect process by any means. Um, and it should be a lot easier, um, one would think and, and hope as we move forward in the years. Um, I was just saying to the panel before, uh, you know, that, that picture of mine is a bit old um, uh, on, on that slide. You know, I, I've, I've been in the industry 20 years now, and uh, whilst there's been lots of change, I think there's still a lot ahead of us that uh, a number of us in the industry would like to see happen. So um, enough from me, because it's not my views you, you, you're here to listen to today. So um, you're here to, for the panel's top fives. So first up, we have Stuart. So Stuart's got over 15 years experience in the property sector and since 2018 he's been working with the government uh, and the overall sector on developing a digital identity trust scheme for the home buying and selling process. Uh, it's known as My Identity uh, and it's a recognised industry standard for carrying out customer identity checks uh, across the, all the stakeholders really involved in that transaction. So quite an interested and probably topical topic. So Stuart over to you please for your top five. Hey, thank you very much, Paul. And good afternoon, everyone. And, you know, very much thank you to TM Group for putting these really interesting talks together. Um, I'm, I'm going to frame my points in the context of speed and convenience. Um, you know, I, I read earlier this, this month that the average buying times are now 153 days compared to 124 in 2019. So we know it's not good, really. And people expect and demand speed and convenience. So my five points to unlocking the property transaction. My first point, I'm going to discuss policy, standards, regulation. And unfortunately, regulation only ever goes in one direction. And to be fair to the poor conveyancer, I think this contributes to their workload as they have to do more stuff, stuff which is often quite administrative in nature. We know that IDNV, identity verification and anti-money money laundering checks, they are a burning issue and increasingly becoming more complex. Some might be aware that in the context of speed and convenience, the government is pushing through Parliament new legislation on how 
digital identity should be done. We know that this is a high friction area for customers, for consumers who have to do it up to five times through the home buying and selling process, often to different standards and using different information and methodologies. Current processes, there are, are an, admin, admin, oh, an administrative and compliance burden for developers, estate agents, conveyances, brokers, and it's, it's for everyone. It is, a, it is a hassle, it's a repetitive task. So I, would, I believe that you know, once the sector adopts the new government standards, it will help reduce customer fiction from having to do multiple IDV and AML checks. It will improve standards as identity provider standards are currently very inconsistent. So therefore there's no trust or reliance in the process. And it will reduce things around property and mortgage fraud as it contributes to the increasing the barriers. But very importantly, contribute towards a smoother and quick, quicker customer onboarding journey as they deal with the different stakeholders through the process. But on that, we mustn't look at identity in isolation because we need to look at operationally as a business, as, as an industry, what other value is there for a certified identity? Because government has in its sight greater customer benefits. So this brings me nicely onto my second point, and that is around digital signatures and the great work the land registry are trying to do around this. Behind a digital signature, though, you need a certified identity through what's called a QTSP, a Qualified Trusted Service Provider. Now, if a customer now has a certified identity, then surely it makes sense that you as a conveyancer or, or broker can use this to sign a document. In this day and age, why do we need a witness wet signature, especially with all the safe and secure technology that now exists? Why would a conveyancer or a broker want to post or email documents to their client to print off, to sign and get a witness? With a certified digital identity, a client can use this to digitally sign all the relevant documents and indeed the conveyancer and broker and all the other people that need to sign documentation can do the exact same. So again, this contributes towards that speed and convenience for the customer and reduce, hopefully, some of the admin tasks carried out by all the relying parties through the process. So it does have many potential operational benefits for all the stakeholders through the process and all the other relying parties. So it's just a contributing factor towards that. And when we're talking about documents, this is, brings me now onto my third point and the difference between PDFs and documents versus data. Um, I hope I don't get too technical here, but we know that within home buying and selling, the process is hugely paper driven. We know that when dealing with data, those of us that do, data is actually much easier and efficient to manage than paper and PDFs. But there's a problem. There are many parties involved in the transaction from agents, customers, developers, conveyances, brokers, lenders, insurance, tradespeople, warranty providers, property searches, certification bodies. You get the gist, the problem goes on. And I would say that the problem is that you will not get all these stakeholders onto an agreed set of standards, taking into account all the different technology uh, providers that they're using in the background, uh, already his, um, you know, stored historical documentation and the budgets required to digitize information. And if you go to the source of the information, trying to get every single creator of information to convert their information into data is extremely difficult. And if we think about property searches, and, and from what I understand is a problem area, you know, do you think we can get every single local authority to digitize their information? I would argue no. The problem is that it's too far low down their priorities. They don't have the money. Plus, you need to get them all to work to one agreed standard. And they all use different providers as well in the background. And then combined with this, you need to help every recipient of information to be able to manage that data. And unfortunately, we need to work. I would say we now need to work with what we have now and how everyone can handle a document and a PDF with the ability to print that off. I know it's not perfect. I absolutely, working in a data company, I think data is the way forward. But you then have the issue of reliance on the data as you're putting your trust in someone else's management of that data because there are so many actors involved in the process, one error breaks that whole chain. So I would argue that at least having a copy of a PDF or a document gives you the information that you need that is factual at a moment in time even out-of-date information provides a perspective. 
And look, I hope that doesn't sound too gloomy, but it's just like a practical issue that we need to be quite cognizant of. On my fourth point here, I'm just going to go slightly spe speculative. Um, today, everyone wants speed and convenience in all aspects of their lives. And there's a focus, especially on younger people here. And um, if we look at how we can now pay for so much online or just using your mobile phone, you know, you you are less likely to go out now without your mobile phone than you are with your personal wallet. You know, we, we are surgically connected to our phones. That's the reality. And as we all know, the value of our mobile phone is immeasurable to us. And the likes of Apple, Samsung, Google are all working on the provision of what are called digital wallets. That's what they are now. They're not just devices to make calls on. You know, digital wallets are also used for gift cards, membership cards, loyalty cards, coupons, event tickets, travel tickets, hotel reservations. In the States, they're being used as driving licenses. You can use your mobile phone as your car, keys, and yes, identity verification. I would argue that here in the UK, we're slightly behind Europe, the US, Australia, you know, our Western economic peers. And I think digital wallets, mobile devices, they're going to become more ubiquitous to controlling and managing our lives and how we interact with the world around us when purchasing products and services. I'm sure we all do. Uh, like me, I use mobile. Um, I use my mobile phone for banking. I can use my bank and open banking to prove my ID rather than having to get my passport and driving license and utility bill. I'm, I'm sorry, but how convenient is that? My mobile phone provides me with the speed and convenience, with more speed and convenience actually than anything else I can really think of. So being speculative, I think that if conveyances and all the relying parties in the home buying and selling process ignore what is happening around us now, today, they do so at the peril. I would say, you know, from our work, the work that we're doing with lenders' financial fraud teams, the security they have in place around mobile phones is incredible, hence their greater trust and reliance on them. So if your customer has a mobile phone, a digital wallet, where they can prove who they are to you, pay you, share relevant information with you all instantly, well, what, what a way to go. Um, digital wallets are proving to be a very fiercely fought battleground between the likes of Apple, Google and Samsung. And they have the power and the might to drive that change. And we need to be very careful of that. And I think we need to understand why. And I would suggest that the home buying and selling sector should not ignore what's coming down the track. I'm not saying it's happening now, but it's what's happening in the future. Which brings me now on to my final point. And that's about people. Um, people manage the home buying and selling process and people still need advice from people through the process. I recently read an article in the Law Society Gazette that conveyancing is not attracting enough young people into the professional. And it's increasingly reliant on an older, albeit more experienced, age of professional. But like any industry, young blood brings new ideas, ways of operating, and they are our future. You know, it's a bit of a cliche. They let us know what we need to be thinking of, and that's reality. And I think as an observer, and being critical, if I may, I read many articles in the press on LinkedIn and Trade Press about collaboration, working together, stop blaming each other is a very common one, but very little in the way of action. Yes, there are many collaborative groups, but these groups operate in silos or compete with each other as vested interests get in the way. And you even have like membership groups that have selective membership. You know, you can only be part of it because you're my pal. This is our sector. It is a people driven transaction, which we mustn't forget. So we are as much the cause of the problems as we are the solutions. You know, we are the key, the conveyancers, the agents, the brokers are the keys to the customer's transaction, a hugely stressful and expensive time for them. So, you know, no one's better place to fix it than us, the people who, who are working in it. These are problems, are granted, that have evolved over time. I think we've got to be aware that conveyancing is becoming more commoditized. Um, I see the difference between technologically driven conveyancing firms and more traditional law firms, where conveyancing is seen as a poor second cousin that often receives very little in the way of real investment. If an industry wants to attract younger people, new blood, people with ideas who are our future, we need to make it attractive to them. It's incumbent on us to make our sector an attractive and rewarding and collaborative one in which to work in. 
because you look at younger people these days, the way that they work is far more collaboratively than the way we, we worked, I would suggest. Reading in the press, I mean, if you look to go into conveyancing, having to work 16 hour days, shuffling paper around, dealing with the stress of client calls, agent calls, broker calls, calls to the lender. It's not really that attractive to anyone in this day and age, especially when things can be done with greater speed and convenience. You know, younger people want an interactive, more technologically driven world and would look for this in their work environment too. And as we know, evidence confirms that people are turning over, especially younger people, they're turning over their jobs with much greater frequency now than we did. So we as the older ones, you know, we need to think about the future of the profession and the industry as a whole. So to conclude, look, I hope these five points are useful, uh, helpful observations and food for thought and what we need to consider as we work to help unlock the property transaction. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much for that, Stuart. And uh, I'm not, I'm not going to summarise because that's Tim's job at the end, but just picking up on one of your points there um, and the digital wallets and trends that's going on. And I, I have to I have to admit, you know, it's, uh, you know, as you say, tickets and everything. But the first time I, I this week I stayed in a hotel and they, they said, well, download your key here then. And so I did the digital key with your hotel room, you know, whizzed past reception, no queuing straight into the room. I even picked my room like you do on a, you know, and that's the first time I'm, I may, may, maybe I'm behind the curve. I'm not sure, but, uh, for, but that's the first time I've done that. I thought, wow, you know, that's an innovation that people wouldn't have dreamed of a few years ago. So yeah, it was in my digital wallet and straight to the room. Um, didn't pick my neighbors though. One, one of them was a little bit noisy. So maybe that's the next, uh, maybe that's the next step. Um, okay, so uh, without further ado then, so next up we've got Jeremy. So uh, Jeremy is the National Head of Residential Property at Irwin Mitchell, uh, so a full service top 20 law firm with offices across the country. Uh, he, he trumps me here with 30 years experience as a, as a solicitor in the residential property world and has been widely quoted in the national press on a, in a range of industry issues as well as on television and, uh, and radio and now TMTV. So welcome Jeremy, over to you for your top five. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, yeah, I've, I've forgotten that 30 years was in the end, so I'm feeling quite old now. But uh, I'm also also hoping, uh, just before I start, a quick shout out that people are thinking, oh, he's wearing a nice pink shirt. The pink shirt is uh, part of uh, Breast Cancer Awareness. Uh, so uh, a little shout out to that fantastic group. Um, so um, I, I sat here thinking about five top tips, five ways we can improve things on um, the conveyancing front and in our world, in the residential property world. Um, and I was thinking, well, what's, what's the job where people's hearts sink when they're, when they're in the team and they get a new conveyancing thing in? Um, it's leasehold. Leasehold has been, been a nightmare for a very long time since I joined uh, the profession. Um, when you get a lease in and you're buying, um, your heart sinks. So my first proposal is for a standard form of residential property lease. Um, so just thinking about the, the problem that I'm trying to address here, um, uh, a lot of buyers won't read or understand their leases, but as conveyancers, we know that unless we are shown to have explained it properly to them, uh, our PI policies are on the hook. Um, they can come with a range of problems. I mean, when I first started, everybody was very excited about mutual enforceability provisions in leases, uh, forfeiture on bankruptcy. More recently, obviously, we've had all kinds of problems with, with ground rent provisions. Effectively, there are pretty much as many different types of residential properties property lease as there are law firms out there. And that's good for nobody whatsoever. This isn't a new idea. There was a little known uh, conservative politician who raised this in a, in a debate in, in the House of Parliament in 1988. And he said, we need to reduce the cost, cut out the defect and the uncertainty of, of leaseholds. Um, that position is still exactly the same as it was. Um, the conveyances listing will be fully aware of that. So how are we, how we going to proceed in terms of introducing that lease? Well, it's obviously going to cause a lot of debate um, as to what goes into the lease, but we need a working party to come up with that standard form of lease. And once we've got it, 
that needs to be a living document, a digital living document um, that is registered at the land registry that everybody can access. So that if someone says to you, I'm buying this property, it's leasehold, you know what's in the lease with the exception of whatever is contained in the extra schedules. So some buildings do have unique features. So what I'm not saying is you can only ever have one form of lease. You'd obviously need to have variations for, for example, mixed use buildings or those with particular types of common parts. But the first idea is, is essentially, let's have a compulsory form of lease it gets introduced for all new leasehold properties and there's the ability for those in franchising or being recorded i'm not sure if you can still hear me i've just had a technical issue at my end can someone give me a wave if i'm still on yeah audio? you, you dropped out briefly but you're back you. okay yeah Okay, there's, uh, <laughs> I'm sure other people will be mentioning tech as the, as, uh, the thing goes on, but uh, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, um, and just to wrap that one up, let's get a standard form of lease. You can have your schedules for the extra bits that you need to, to individualize your leases in, in accordance with the buildings that you've got. But if we do that, let's ditch common hold as well. Um, Okay, number two, uh, we need a clear and phased introduction to the material information provisions. Now, um, we've got a, a mixed audience here and, and not everybody will know the, the background to the material information provisions. So what we're talking about here is a uh, requirement under the 2008 Consumer Protection Regulations, which have been solidly ignored by pretty much everybody in the industry since they were introduced. Um, I remember going on lots of courses um, when I was taught about those uh, consumer protection regulations. I wrote some articles in 2008 and everyone said, this is going to transform the industry. You need to provide all the information up front and uh, it's going to mean no more caveat emptor. It's all up front. Here we go. Rah. And then 14 years later, we have just about introduced phase A through trading standards saying, oh, look, guys, you probably ought to tell people how long the lease is, uh, what the ground rent is, and a few other really basic bits of information. So it's taken 14 years to get to that point. Trading standards, unfortunately, in my view, are under-resourced and unable to properly enforce that. We're still getting memorandums of sale pitching up on our desks, which don't meet even the basic information. I was at a, a conference recently where it was said that parts B and C, which are hugely different and require a massive amount of extra information to be added in at the front stage, are going to be introduced by the end of the year. There was pandemonium in the audience um, and it seems as though that's been backtracked on slightly. What we need, therefore, is a clear phased introduction um, so that everyone can prepare everyone knows exactly what is going to be needed and when, and then it needs to be enforced. Okay, uh, moving on to number three, uh, government loans for home improvements. Um, okay, so what's the problem I'm trying to address? The fact is that um, our housing stock is amongst the oldest and worst insulated stock in Europe. I've got a load of facts and figures, but I think through my uh, technical glitch, I might be running slightly behind. So I'll glaze over those. We'll take it as read that we know that our housing stock is pretty awful. Uh, and sadly, the numbers of excess deaths this winter are going to be exacerbated by the high energy costs um, that we're currently suffering from as a result of various, various issues around the world. So. The solution I'm putting forward uh, for my third issue is government support. Um, I think NatWest uh, were, were quoted publicly recently saying that most of the stock that they're involved with, there's an average of £14,000 that needs to be spent on each property in order to properly insulate it, in order for, to bring it up to standards. We've got some really good targets out there for net zero and reduction of carbon emissions. 
we are going backwards. It's an absolute nightmare when you look at the housing stock. Um, they abolished the green grants. Um, it's been a mess since and people are not insulating their houses. So my solution is give people grants. Those grants will be secured on their properties. Elderly people should be first in the queue so they can get properly insulated homes. It will come out of the equity of their homes and it can be linked to house price index. So the increase in the value of their properties can be funded uh, and can be reflected in what the government will get back. Uh, it shouldn't spook the markets if the, if the government spends a load of money on that because it will create extra jobs and revenue and it will assist the economy. So that's number three for me. Number four, um, I've thrown this in, it's just a, a little bit of a provocative one. Uh, what do I want from my number four? I want an independent housing ministry. Um, I would like um, housing planning um, and housing delivery to be unhooked from politicians. Um, again, I've got a lot of stats. So I'll, I'll leave some of those out just so that I can keep to time. But the housing minister was, was created as a position in 1997. There have been 21 since then. It's a revolving door. Pretty much all of them have had no long-term commitment to our industry. We need people committed to it. We don't want interference from politicians who say in public, yes, we're going to deliver 300,000 homes. They never do. And those very same politicians are the ones saying, we do need those 300,000, but they can't be in my constituency. We all know that. Um, my, my model for this um, is they said it couldn't be done with the Bank of England. It was government controlled. It was unhooked. Uh, it's now an independent organisation which is doing its best to combat what's happening with the politicians. Um, I've got my, got my uh, iPhone running time just so that I don't go over. And I've just seen Liz Truss has been dragged in to see Graham Brady. So um, by the time we finish this, we're probably going to get a new housing minister <laughs> in the near future anyway. Um, the, the downgrading of that position um, is also deeply worrying to anybody that cares about the housing industry and our housing stock. So from my point of view, um, it's a little bit provocative. If I can't have an independent ministry, uh, Paul or Tim, if you say, look, Jeremy, you've been smoking something, we're not giving you that. Um, as, as a fallback, how about we go for a Secretary of State with a seat of the Cabinet whose sole responsibilities are housing delivery, planning reform and efficacy and green measures throughout our housing stock. Um, OK, that leads me on to my last one. Um, this, this hopefully will resonate with some of the more tech minded uh, members of the panel and the audience. Um, I'm, I'm talking about logbooks for homeowners. Um, they are the future. I think we all know that. Uh, my concern is that um, the logbook providers are doing their absolute best to, to regulate themselves and to work together. Um, but we don't have any proper regulation and we don't have a clear idea of how logbooks are going to be adopted by the industry. I'm a big fan. Um, I do believe that they are the way ahead. And what I mean by that is we need uh, a single digitally recorded source of information for properties. Um, if you look at what the land registry is doing, um, they're, they're, they're doing their best to follow countries such as Holland. It was a fascinating talk on TMTV's last one of these sessions when it was mentioned that local land charges were brought into their equivalent of the land registry some time back and they're much more efficient as, as a result. Why can't we be more ambitious than that? Let's just get everything in a central place. It's a logbook and my proposal is that those logbooks should be paid for by homeowners. We can say to people, look, uh, it, as part of your home ownership, you need to maintain a central register and pay for it. But it would also be mandated for utilities, state bodies, local authorities and, and other regulatory um, bodies 
to provide the information and to update it. We all know that flooding and other things like that need to be centrally recorded and advised to clients. So why not just get it in one place and tell people you need your logbook um, and you need to keep it updated. And we tell all the statutory and other bodies you need to be updating that for people. Property Mark are behind it, the Law Society are behind it. So I think it's got industry-wide recognition that this is something that we need. So um, Paul, I hope I haven't um, had any more glitches. And I'll, no, I'm no, that no that's, on that. I'm pretty much on time as well, Jeremy. So thanks for that. Yeah, I'm an early shout out there for property logbooks, property passports, called what we will. And I think that's certainly part of the uh, digitalization of the journey of, of home ownership that we're seeing. Yeah, I guess the wallet plus uh, of, what we're, of what Stuart was talking about, really. So, yeah, perfect. And with regards to a cabinet position, you know, this this lasts an hour. So there's bound to be a few seats around the cabinet table by the time we've finished, I would, I would think. Um, so uh, mo moving on then. So uh, introducing now uh, Tim Smith. Um, uh, who is founder and CEO of Insight Legal Software, and as I said earlier, also chair of the LSSA, um, and, uh, and and I join him in vice chair role of that, uh, which is the Legal Software Suppliers Association. So Tim's been in legal technology and software for more than twenty five years. Uh, he's founder of Insight Legal, um, and uh, which produces practice and case management software used by more than a thousand law firms. Um, so Tim, over to you for your top five, please. Thank you very much, Paul. Yes, yes. So it's um, as as Paul said, it's it's I've got kind of two hats on today. One is um, a CEO of, of of Insight Legal, who who have obviously with a thousand law firms, we have an awful lot of conveyances within with amongst amongst our users, and also as chair of the ISSA. So in preparation for this, I've I've gone out to the membership of the ISSA to ask them some of their ideas for for what what's good for unlocking conveyancing, as well as speaking to uh, to some of our own customers. Um, <clears throat> First, I'd like to say, Jeremy, I, I, I'd vote for you. Those all sounded like great, great, great things. So, um, yeah, you've, you've absolutely got my vote um, at the, the, the general election, whatever that might be. So um, maybe, maybe the next few days, we'll see. We'll see. So, so yeah. So, so, but some some great, some great ideas so far. Um, so, putting together, you know, conversations with our own customers and and with uh, a lot of other members of the LSSA. Other members of the LSSA, obviously, they also provide software and and. Uh, services to to law firms or almost exclusively um so you know they have a lot of experience of of conveyances from a from a from a lawyer's point of view um maybe not so much the state agents or other other, other stakeholders but they're very much um uh concentrating on, on solicitors so um number one that, that that came up a few times and and i was a little bit surprised by this um but is that the, the speed of onboarding clients uh, you would think that's something that people do so frequently it, it, it should be just just a, a very routine process and it, it might be because it's a little bit um repetitive and and, and <laughs> just bloody hard work but uh, uh onboarding clients seems to be a, a a frequent problem that people have and there's there's a there's a number of electronic ways that people have tried to improve this so far but it still means collecting a lot of name details address details and then obviously all the other information uh uh, relating to all the other parties as well. So just that that onboarding process seems to be uh, a lot of lawyers just find that's just like like pulling teeth, just getting all that information in one place, uh, and just so they can start the case. That that sort of sort of slowing them down and 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 uh, is 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 a problem, which is probably one of the things that is con contributing to the to the extending time of of, of a convincing transaction, uh, because there is so much more information they have to gather these days, because they have got to do all the ID checks, all the AML checks, so there is a lot more information they've got to get in the first place, uh, and they have to have all of that in place before they can really start accepting money and start working on behalf of that client. So, so any way of improving that would would, would certainly certainly be very very welcome. Um, subsequent to that, and, and almost kind of linked to that in some ways is having the IDs or making sure all of the IDs of all the parties have been uh, properly verified before anything starts. And this is something that, that, that Stuart was talking about. And I think that's something that, that, that is, is a problem for, for a, lot of, a lot of firms. It's, it's difficult for them to get that information from their clients, that the idea of having some sort of digital wallet where, they can, where the clients can, can almost just, just self-certify in a really quick way is, is absolutely fantastic. But then you have the, the, the issue that, that I know we've had uh, some some cases where there's been a certain amount of cyber crime where those those people were verified and they thought they were all good but they weren't so um, there's there are some some issues around that uh, which are which are obviously very problematic 
but it's not just the clients. Um, the, the, the law firm has to have faith and, and, and confidence in all the other parties they're talking to as well. And this is a, this 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 can be a, a significant problem when they're dealing with other law firms they never dealt with before, or branches of these they never dealt with before, to verify that all those people are actually who they say they are, because there is a, a fair amount of, uh, of of cyber crime and, and fraud going on around that. So that's that's one area where I think a lot of a lot of our customers and a lot of uh, other law firms would, would really like to have some kind of assistance. Um, the, the 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 third one, and 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 this is one that that. Uh, Jeremy was sort of touching on and 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 and, and Stuart as well to an extent is 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 the property 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 details. So the property logbook is is, is a great thing. Uh, no, nobody's dared say the word hip yet, but um, so I'll, I'll I'll be the first just to just to get the one out there. But you know the the home information pack is is does does have a lot. Wasn't an entirely bad idea, but now there is there is such an opportunity to do a, a much better version of that. And and, and Jeremy's already mentioned that. I already talked about centralizing at the, at the the land registry which is would, would seem to be one obvious place but there's with 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 the blockchain technology that we can now kind of use that might be one of the perfect perfect uses for it so that uh, we can have a decentralized um, database of all of the things that have happened to a property now I can see Jeremy you're not exactly keen on that idea but that's that might be that might be it might be it might be a, a very good option. It might be the the the, the first time of well, well, a good opportunity to use that kind of technology in uh, in in the conveyancing process. So you could have all the parties that have important information about a property can update that themselves. So it would mean that it's not down to the homeowner to have to record every time British Cast come out and service their boiler, or have to record every time there's a there's a search or, or any of these things. If those are all things. Uh, that are held centrally somewhere, then anybody who has the right to view that information, uh, which is obviously a bit of an issue, but anybody has the right to view that information can then say, right, I have got full confidence that all the information is here for that property, and I've got a central location for it, and I can I can see that, uh, and, I, and, I, and there's lots of things that I don't need to do because all the information is already here. So that would massively speed up, I think, um, uh, the process. Whether it's practical or not, whether we can get over some of the regulatory things around that is is, is certainly certainly a challenge. But um, a, a sort of decentralised home logbook, home information would 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 certainly make make a huge difference, I think, to the to, to the process. And and uh, as as others have said, there's there's you know other countries are making some progress on that sort of on those, along those sorts of lines. So it'd be fantastic if, if if the UK could be at the forefront of, of doing that in a in a in a, in a bigger way. Um, one, one of the other things that, that came up amongst our customers at the LSSA as well was chain visibility, and this is this is one where it's it's there's some 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 serious history here. Uh, um, first person to mention hips, but um, I, I think Vea was the one of the, the the law society's first attempt at this, and and um, that obviously obviously crashed and burned. They had some really good ideas the principle was 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 pretty sound and as the law society they were probably the organization that would have had the clout to be able to uh, uh, make sure it was actually used so they had a great idea uh, they were the right people to do it uh, the only issue was they went to produce some software but but the software didn't really work or ever materialize which um which they, they were good at everything else the marketing was good the plan was good the people were good but but they forgot to do the software really which was which was a bit of a problem and and, and then they, they they sort of quashed that uh, but but the idea is 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 a, is a sound one and I, I can also remember um from my well just call it 25 years that the law society sorry the land registry also trying something similar they tried to create their own chain matrix um everybody can see all the other parties that are going on and it's something that i know Lots of other organisations are still are still trying to do, and we've still got a lot of a, a lot of uh, uh, um, work going on on that at the moment. There are obviously some GDPR and regulatory issues around that. It's 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 not a not an easy thing to to make work, um, uh, but it, it needs a critical mass. It, it can only work if there's a critical mass behind it, and and to get that critical mass, it needs widespread support. So. You know, it, it's 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 absolutely a challenge to get that, but but I think if if we can find a way of of, of getting a a standard and everybody agreeing to that standard, um, then I think there's that has a, a great potential as as a way of really really improving things. Um, and that actually 
in many respects it brings you on to the, the the fifth um fifth one which if we can have a working chain metrics of some some variety then improving the communications between all parties would be something that would come out of that so between our customers and and the issa members that the a way of digitizing and automating communication is, is one of the things that, that that's very much come up that people um in 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 Financing process really, really want to be able to see because we we all know about and, and I think Paul, you actually mentioned at the beginning, you know, all those telephone calls you have, you know, frantically trying to trying to trying to phone the 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 the, um, the lender to make sure you know your money can be released. It's just so inefficient. And, and and Jeremy, you must you must do this all the time where you've got you know on a Friday, how many phone calls are you making to how many different people? Get this done. Get this done. Are you ready? What's happening? Why has this not happened? Why? It, 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 it's just it's there's just so much of that and, and then it's probably a lot of it is is, is unnecessary if there was a, a, a simple way um that we could have some sort of unified communication between all the parties parties it would need to be electronic it would need to be. if you can already see the status of the lender and you know that they will release the money at three o'clock you don't have to call them at 245 go, where is it where is it when are you doing it if, if they've already put that information out there and committed to that so Improving the communication between all parties, I think, is one of the one of the biggest things that that that, that a lot of uh, our customers and uh, SSA members thought would really really make a difference. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, Tim. That, I think that, that's uh, interest of time. I think let's. Let, I, I need to step in there and move us on. I think just sure. picking up on one of your points there. So the matrix, um, a dystopian future in which humanity is unknowingly trapped inside a simulated <laughs> reality. Probably how a home move falls. <laughs> Um, right, uh, with no further ado, then uh, uh, finally uh, from our panel before Tim has the, uh, as I say, unenvious job of pulling all this together for us is uh, is David Bridge. Um, so David's been around the commencing industry for, I think we've got quite a lot of uh, you know experience around the panel today. Um, and in his most recent roles, he's, uh, he's uh, working at uh, Kite Liz since yeah. May 2022, but he also sits on the Convention Association Executive Board, where he looks at policy and standards and tries to affect change for the better within the industry as a whole. So that's uh, quite a quite a larger topic there, David. But uh, for your top five, uh, please, uh, 10 minutes, away you go. You're on mute. <laughs> Start. That was a good start, wasn't it? Um, a relief for some, I suspect. Um, so yeah, one of the problems of going last is, of course, other people have touched on quite a lot of what one might have wanted to say. So um, one of my complaints you'll come to is duplication. Um, so please forgive my duplication. Uh, so there's an irony there. But um, I think I'm, my, my top five go into a bit more about where we are, not where we're going, um, because actually Sometimes we need to actually look at fixing the process now. That's actually what the customers want, is what do we do now? Not necessarily what are we going to do when and if we have a stable government to actually take some interest in it. Um, so for me, my, my first one uh, has been touched on, and that has to be centralised IT checking. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, but looking at it from the point of view of the conveyancer, I think it's important to understand that we're doing it because we catch the liability, and this will be a recurring theme in some of what I say. One of the, re the only reason we have to check the client's ID is because everyone else has checked it before it, manages to pass the parcel down the line. Actually, the person who, if you look at the way the cases go and so forth, that tends to get into the most trouble for these things is the solicitor or the conveyancer, because they're the ones who are left holding the baby and release the funds and actually make the money laundering transactions or whatever it might be. So I think it's not just having centralized ID, because I think, you know, as everyone said, that actually is something we're moving towards gently um, and slowly, but it is also having the confidence to rely on it. And from the lawyer's point of view, that has to be made specific, um, that, that we can, if the estate agent has checked it, or whoever is first in the queue, whoever gets them first, if they've done it to a certain standard, we've got to be given an absolute clear view that we can rely on it. Otherwise, we will do it again because we're scared. And therefore, we'll create the log jam. You've only got to look at the HIPS to see what happened there. The HIPS came with searches. A whole half the profession used to do them again because they wouldn't trust somebody else's searches. I mean, it's ridiculous, but that's the way it works. So it um, seems to me that, that, is, that that's something, it's, it's used that, but it needs to be done sensibly so that everyone
speeding along here because I tend to go over. <laughs> um, but my second point is actually just to challenge the premise of the question to a certain, slight extent. Why do we need to speed it up? Why is speed this end, this end goal that everyone wants to look at? Um, it seems to me that picking up on something Paul said in the introduction, they want it quicker and easier. I think there's a confusion there. I think sometimes people see easier as quicker, but actually we have quite a complicated job to do and we perform quite a complicated service. I think it can be done more efficiently, but that isn't necessarily quicker. Um, it might be a better way of looking at it, perhaps slightly oddly, is reduce the delay rather than in speed up the process. Um, because I think, you know, the quickest transaction I've done from instruction to completion was three hours. So it can be done. It is not that the process itself is inherently impossible for it to be done quickly. It's actually all the logistics around the process that actually take the time. And that can be fixed sometimes by experience, sometimes by using technology, sometimes by um, concentrating on the service, sometimes by not having uh, too many cases. So therefore, you know, you can argue being paid properly for the job so you don't have to have too many cases. Um, I think the other question with that is, is also going quickly. And, you know, I've been part of large conveyancing firms. I've certainly worked with them over the years. We all use technology. Oh, this will speed it up. This will speed it up. It's all about time and motion studies. That's when you then get the other half of the profession saying, and especially us old experience ones going, oh, but the quality's declined. And that's what takes the time. Because to go fast, you're using technology to tick box answers. And actually somebody comes along somewhere in the chain and says, yeah, have you really thought about that? Really? I'm not sure that's actually what you meant to say or, or whatever. So I think, I think that, that that would be my, my second point is, is don't go all out for speed. Go out for efficiency and speed will follow. But efficiency is using technology smartly. Um, you know, don't... Um, don't use it as a, as a silver bullet, because it isn't. You need to have it, but use it wisely. Uh, my number three, um, I think this will sound like very um, uh, poor me, but I, I hope some people will understand where I'm coming from. I think the, re the reliability on conveyances has got to stop building and building and building, because we, we, we are at the bottom of the food chain when it comes to that. Everyone else leaks their liability down to us. Um, and I think that just increases on, a, on most law firms. It increases their liabilities, increases their, the time they take and the effort they have to put in, the resource they have to put in to deal with that liability, which means that their margins are lower, which means they have to take on more cases, which I think personally inherently slows down the process. So it's a, it's a bit of a knock-on effect, that one. But... For, for example, we, we are coming up, we're now supposed, the Law Society has a, a briefing note coming out soon that we are supposed to advise on the environmental impact um, coming, uh, going, going forward into the future. Um, most conveyances are looking around going, sorry, we've got to do that. So now we're looking to, obviously to, to the other parts of the industry to say, well, how are we going to do that? But the truth is we can't. I know nothing about environ, advising on in, environmental impact over the next 20, 30, and 50 years. Um, and I've been doing this a long time, I'm quite good at it. Put somebody who's a newly qualified into that position, how are they going to do it? So we're not going to do it. What we'll do is spend a lot of time worried about not doing it. And then we will raise a whole load of inquiries just to try and cover our backside as to, I think we've covered it off. Hopefully if we ask enough questions, we will um, get away with it. That is slowing the process down. It's putting barriers in. But it's regulation that, if, if you like, is putting that barrier in. Why did they select the lawyers? My guess is because the surveyors said, oh, no, we're not doing that. And they went, oh, OK, we'll get the lawyers to do it. Um, that's not beating up on surveyors. Good luck to them. I wish we would do the same. But it's sort of similar, I suppose, to CQS, isn't it? Do we need CQS? I don't think we do. I think it puts more, more uh, liability onto us. It puts more uh, regulation onto us. We spend more time dealing with it, less time doing the job. Again, we're back to duplication and so forth. So um, I think we, we've got to stop shifting the risk. And every time a new risk comes up, every time that there's a revision in bell, what we do, we've got to somehow as a profession say, we're not the right place for this. That will speed up the process. 
Um, my third point is reduce duplication. Um, as I said earlier, um, there are the obvious ones we've already talked about, everyone checking ID, but you've got um, surveyors visiting the property and then asking us to confirm boundaries. But I don't visit the property, so how can I confirm the boundary? And there seems to be to be quite a lot of duplication in the process. You have it with signed documents. Um, you know, we've got, this one's got to be signed. Oh, it's not been signed right. I've got to send it out again. That's also a duplication that would be fixed by digital signatures, I think, in that particular case. Because at least then, actually, you wouldn't have to worry about, oh, I can't read the, I can't read the witness's name, or I can't, um, you didn't get a witness, or you didn't do the witnessing in the right place. Those things create drag on the system quite considerably, and they could be fixed tomorrow. It could be fixed tomorrow also by people following the process that you set them out, but that's a, a slightly different question. Um, so I think... Um, Past the coin and we, we miss source of funds and source of wealth I think out of that conversation and we must um, because I think that that to me is a drag again where lawyers are being asked to do something we're not best placed to do the lender and the broker have already checked the source of funds we can check it from an AML point of view to a degree but the 90% of cases have a mortgage they are actually people who understand numbers they understand financial transactions they understand if a client's got a pot of you know um bonds in America or whatever. We don't. And I don't think we're the right person to do it. But again, we seem to have to do it to backstop. The lenders won't tell us what they know because they want to see if we pick it up to backstop them. So I'm conscious of time. Yeah, so um, they were, we're overrunning slightly. So yeah, uh, quick, quick, make sure you get all your seconds. points across. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ed education, which was, um, we've got to educate clients as to what we do and why we do it. Agents, to understand why we have to be cautious. We don't do it deliberately. Um, don't set out, manage justification, manage expectations, don't promise what we can't deliver. Um, and also pay the right amount for the right job. If I've only got five jobs to do, I will do them brilliantly and quickly. If I've got 20, less so. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much um thanks very much for that so good that it's not all about technology good that it's about people and process there as well so thanks very much for, for that david so so now over over to tim who's got i really quite not like the title actually director of property science innovation so i quite like that one uh so he's worked for right move since 2010 um and yeah please try and summarize all of that so that we can then get a polling right at the end thanks very much tim over to you uh, thanks and um, yeah thanks for having me on and also Thanks to everybody for their you know, amazing uh, comments and really in-depth um, uh, thoughts they've had on, on, on the topic. I think from my perspective and from coming from Rightmove, I'm coming at this from a sort of uh, uh, the consumer side of things, thinking about what problem are we trying to solve um, in unlocking the transaction. Um, and, and I know we've mentioned you know, how can we make things uh, speedier, how can we remove stress um, uh, and how can we sort of make it more efficient from a cost perspective as well? But, you know, and I think if we're doing that, that's probably what, what's going to remove a lot of the problems I think consumers feel there are in a, in a, in, in a transaction at the moment. Um, just to give you a couple of numbers, uh, we have seen the number, the amount of time it takes to sell a property from the moment you try to sell it to the moment it completes um, is 180 a day, so six months. Um, Back in January 18, that 110 of those were um, conveyancing and 72 were the selling bit, like going from so um, offer to sold, um, uh, to so sold subject to contract. Uh, so 60, 40. Now it's 143 days to 150 for the bit from sold to completing. And it's only 37 from the day, from the beginning. So it's, it's gone to 80, 20. So um, quite a dramatic change and where there's, um, perhaps some of those stresses are, are coming for people. So what I try to do is I try to pull out um, some of the things I think that might help um, from what people have said, it, um, solve some of that stress um, and speed up some of that time. The, the first bucket was communication. I think everybody sort of mentioned this, touched on it, um, and particularly communication through the process. Um, what's expected of people? Um, I think David just mentioned this around um, you know, life's about managing expectations. So I think people go into the process not really knowing who should be doing what 
and when it and when it should be done and what's the realistic expectation for for the whole process um and i think a lot can be done to sort of help people through that journey uh, and build that communication from the consumer side of things and then linking people up along the way because obviously uh, it's not just conveyance there's lots of people involved in, in that um getting through to completion um so how are they communicating and i think obviously i, I think most people who have spoken so far feel that there could be some improvements in that and if that could be an area of focus that that seems like a top a top one to to, to focus on that leads me on to um visibility I, I think they go hand in hand i think a lot of these top um picks go hand in hand so um chain visibility for example um being one i know that's a, a key element um that will help people focus in on where there might be problems um, I think maybe some people that go into buying a home um, don't even realize they're going to be in a chain, don't even know what a chain really is. And then suddenly they're in a chain and they have not have to care about what's happening to lots and lots of different people. Um, so that can be quite overwhelming. And I think, um, so Tim, I think mentioned this, and that seems like you know, a, good, a good additional sort of piece that can go with communication to try and help remove some of that stress. Um, that leads me on to another piece of stress, which is information. Um, I think Jeremy mentioned this, and a number of people have mentioned uh, uh, sort of uh, other attempts at uh, improving uh, the information we have about the home um, and getting that information to people at the right moment um, and with the right information around the information. So I, I don't think it's it, um, you need to give people the information that they need at the right time in the right way, in a way that they can understand it. Um, and I think we're making steps, you know, material information is a big step along that line. Um, and uh, glad we're making it. And there are other parts to that as well. Um, and if you can furnish people with the right information at the right time, and you've helped with visibility and you've helped with communication, I think you're gonna start unlocking things. Um, and that then leads me on to digitization. That's been mentioned by people a lot as somebody from a, from a tech business. Clearly, I'm going to be talking about that and somebody who's spent his time working on, on data for many, many years now. You know, the more you can digitize, the more efficiency you can gain. Um, and I know, if, you know people have mentioned specifically ID checks, speaking to people I know who've recently gone through um, the process of buying a home, the amount of times that they have various different types of ID check. Um, they say it's reasonably efficient each time they're doing it, but it's so many times they're doing it. Uh, it just adds to the stress and the feeling of, of, of constantly having to do the same thing. And maybe this is like um, that point around duplication and trying to remove that because duplication adds to stress, I think, and in all people, not just a consumer, but obviously it sounds like the convincing uh, uh, side of things as well. People don't want to keep on doing the same thing over and over again. Um, it's not um, particularly um, efficient. And lastly, um, Sort of stepping back from it all would be just overall education. Um, I, I, I don't think people really go into the process um, of buying a home really knowing um, what they're in store for. Um, and if they can, if we can have more information, uh, more education at the beginning of the process, even before they go, they're, they're sort of um, before they go into the purchase of the home, um, before they decide to put their property up for um, for sale. I think that could really help ease some of those feelings of stress and the time it takes. Um, I was speaking to somebody who mentioned, you know, they had no idea how much they'd have to do from an anti-money laundering perspective about how many, how much they would have to prove how they got hold of the deposit um, and how they had, you know, they were getting money from their um, parents and how much time it would take them to um, pull in information from their parents uh, about where they got the money. So um, yeah, if they knew that beforehand, they could prepare themselves they're educated on it, it might remove some of that stress. So those would be the, the sort of five top bits I think I've pulled out from what people have said so far. Um, over to you, Paul. Thank, thanks very much, Tim. So uh, I think uh, we're gonna do, as I say, that audience participation now in the last minute of our session. So hopefully we can get a top five up and uh, let's get some votes going on that if you can see it. Um, so yeah, I mean, some interesting ideas and thank you very much for to the panel for their insights there. ID, process, education, great to see those. I think if I was just summarizing some of the, some of the, the points that, you know, from my, my history and career within the property industry, it was uh, HIPS, chain matrix, property passports, very much back to the future. So I'm just gonna go and see if my DeLorean's parked outside and uh, see if I can help there. Um, so uh, 
but I've got the poll as well. I've pressed that one. Um, I, I might. So, uh, are we? How, how's the poll going? Um, TM Group, TM Group Zoom. Is that, have we uh, got uh, got some results there for us? Perfect. Okay, so visibility, no, no for visibility, but um, but certain digitization, yeah, you know, it's a quite an equal split there to be fair. And uh, yeah, I think the digitization journey is certainly uh, on the way. Um, but I think the education stuff is, is something that we all should focus on a bit more. And I think that's possibly what that says. So um, thank you very much for, for joining us today um, in what is the last of the uh, TM TV sessions for 2022. Um, if you've enjoyed today, please subscribe to our channel and uh, the, the previous sessions are uh, the previous sessions are, are also there that you can view them. And uh, thank you once again to the panel. Uh, great to see you. And uh, we look forward to more sessions in 2023. Thank you.